welcome to the third instalment of Rag Trader Live at Mercedes-Benz Fashion Week Australia. The repositioning of Fashion Week this year to lead the global resort season comes at a time when brand Australia is stronger than ever. Ellery is showing on the Paris circuit. Zimmerman is expanding its store footprint across the United States. And our fashion bloggers, including Nicole Warren and Margaret Zhang, are ranked among the most influential in the world. That's just the tip of the Bondi iceberg. But how do international buyers and stylists perceive us? Are we as good as we think? And what can we learn about success in the competitive markets they operate in? Please join me in welcoming our panellists to the stage. Yep, come on up and I'll introduce them as they walk on past. We have Aisha Bennett, who is a buyer for Bergdorf Goodman. Catherine Barber, who is a stylist, if you can't tell. And Natalie Kingham, who is the buying director at matchesfashion.com. So should I read your buyer profiles or, yeah, you want to sound good? All right, we'll do it. So Natalie from matchesfashion.com has had an incredibly diverse career in fashion, including the launch of her own label in 2000. In 2010, she joined matchesfashion.com as international women's wear buyer and has been the driving force behind the covetable list of collaborations and exclusive launches, including collections by Altazura, Vivian Westwood, Erdem and Preen. Natalie became buying director in 2003, overseeing all aspects of women's wear buy for matchesfashion.com. Aisha, who I just learned has a pilot's license, is a native of Boston and began her career as an assistant buyer at Neiman Marcus in the home decor office. After two years, she relocated to New York and became a member of the Bergdorf Goodman team. Over the course of her career, Aisha has been the merchant for Swim, Lingerie, Hosieri, is that how you say it? Hosieri. Cool. Coats and designer sportswear. She celebrated seven years at Bergdorf Goodman this past April. Catherine has a prominent career in fashion and film. She has worked across styling to consulting to the design of her own collections. As a Paris-based stylist, she has worked on editorial shoots for Vogue, Vanity Fair, Interview, and many more. Her cinematic debut earned her a César, is that how you say it? Mm -hmm nomination in the best costume category for French film, My Little Princess, in 2012. So we'll start off with a relatively easy question. What had been your favorite shows so far and why? Catherine? Oh, um, well, for me, this morning, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Romance was born. <laughs> it was wonderful. Um, it was on many levels, in my opinion, perfect uh, where we were completely uh, drawn in and embraced into, into a world that I think uh, when we go to shows and when we work in fashion or anything that is creative to celebrate fantasy and to celebrate uh, creativity. I wanted to be that woman. And that's, what, yeah. and that's how it should be. It's, it's to be transported and to fantasize and um, I mean the the location was amazing the the music was wonderful uh, the ladies were divine it was it was divine and um, for an Australian duo team to uh, produce something like that um, I felt they had their identities so there wasn't where at times I can feel and see a whitewash and dilution of what I know and see in Europe and New York, for example, uh, which can happen in New York as well, where Europe is concerned, I feel. But there, there was uh, there, we were we were indulged and welcomed into their world, and it was divine. It had a strong point of view, had its own DNA. It was very confident. It wasn't looking to be anything other than it well, really was, mm -hmm. and that. 
that is what great design is all about, and good fashion. Is about. And I think that's what fashion Even if it's is. Your aesthetic or not, well, it's exactly. Just to to celebrate one's identity mm -hmm. and and dream and. Um, and vocabulary, and they definitely had their vocabulary. It's and the details were just the impeccable. Details were divine. All of the accessories, the hair, yes. just really drew you in. It's interesting, before you guys arrived, we did a series of interviews with international buyers from Matches, Bergdorf Goodman, and Shopbop.com. And when I asked them what is a core cool piece of advice that you'd give to an Australian designer or an Australian brand who wants to export, all of you and Shopbop as well said the importance of brand DNA and refining that. Um, do you think there's a strong brand DNA among Australian designers based on what you've seen at these collections? Romance was born as obviously a standout. Were there any really unique points of difference that you saw? Um, I think so. I think there has been some brands that have got some very strong DNA. I think they need to, some of them need to get stronger and not, I think sometimes, like you were saying, it's slightly, everybody's looking at look at getting more and influenced by other people and then trends or, or, and that's not what buyers are looking for. And I don't think it's what the customer's looking for. They want to be excited by newness and innovation and fantasy and, um, you know, whether it's clean or minimal or whether it's maximalism, it just needs to be your own, their own DNA. I think, when um, I've been here in the past, and there's been Zimmerman and, and uh, Ellery as well, they've all got very strong DNA. And Romance is born has got strong, that's, that's, that's what you need. And how important is the Australian market from the other perspective, consumers, for the international buyers? How important is the Australian consumer to your overall business? The Australian consumer? Mm. Yeah. So you were yes, saying, yeah. yeah. Um, Australia <coughs> falls into our top five. Um, of countries that we're working with and that are shopping with us. So it's an important market. Um, globally, um, our business is very strong. So to be in the top five, it's, it's a good position. It is, considering there are, I don't know how many countries in the world, but top yeah. five. And consistently, Net-A-Porter, ASOS, um, you know, all the international retailers count Australia as their top five market for exports. You like shopping online? We do. Mm -hmm. Because you're so far away. No. <laughs> <laughs> is that the same for you, Aisha? I think just based on distance, Australia for us falls within the top 15. Geography is yeah, Geography is a big uh, thing for us, I think. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And for the brands, uh, for the retailers that stock Australian designers, what are your top performing Australian designers? Zimmerman and Ellery are not only good performing brands as Australian designers, they're good performing designers and brands. And I think what's important is, is that no, no country should think of themselves just as that country. We're not, when we're globally looking for new brands to work with, we're not thinking, oh, well, we need to pick that up from Paris and that from London and that from Australia. It's just wherever you find good design, Oh, and, and a good collection, and you buy it where, wherever it comes from, it doesn't... There is no discrimination. No, no, no. And Catherine, you work with all manner of brands across all manner of genres. What Australian designers do you find resonate on the world stage within your work? I just discovered Romance was born in Paris, uh, and they asked me the, um, the Australian showroom, Champ Senegal version. Uh, to host the event, and um, and I really loved uh, the sensibility. Um, of course, I know of Zimmerman and um, Ellery, but uh, I come from Sydney originally, and um, yes, I do, darling. <laughs> and um, I left millenniums ago, but I do feel that. Australia, and not to also create this indulgent Australian fashion movement, but there, there are situations that can be ultra synonymous with Australia that can be translated into something in a direction where aesthetics and, you know, and I just felt that romance was born, embrace that. Uh, so, okay, I'm wearing Rumors, was born, I love the show. They're not paying me, but <laughs> uh, uh, j'adore, voila. And Aisha, you were saying earlier that Camilla was 
the first Australian brand that you introduced to Bergdorf Goodman. Can you tell me how that came about and what it was about the brand that caught your attention? Well, and I certainly think it speaks to the, the trend that we've seen over the past six years. We launched it about six years ago. I saw it on somebody on vacation, you know, on a celebrity and kind of tracked it down to try to get it because I thought that there was something really captivating about the prints and, um, and Camilla has done a very good job of staying true to herself and always kind of really going after the print and silhouettes. Um, and at the time there was this emerging resort wear resort lifestyle trend where the swim department was moving away from just one pieces and bikinis to what am I taking away with me on vacation and you got a lot of look um, at a very valuable price and it was it was an amazing launch and we've had such a successful business with her um, and it has continued to grow so for us you know she is our first uh, foray into the Australian designers and I think you know really brought Australia to our to the forefront for us at least and then have since launched Dion Lee um, and Zimmerman also. And did you find Dion Lee via his New York showroom presence or his New York Fashion Week? Or how do, I guess for the Australian designers sitting in the audience, how do they get the attention of global buyers such as yourselves? Well, um, to Natalie's point, Dion Lee was, was something that was in a showroom, but again, we're not necessarily looking for specific things from a specific market. If we find something that we love and we want to get behind, we'll find a way to do it. And it and it doesn't really matter where it comes from, but I think it's nice that as we become a much more global society, that we as merchants are representing the people that are shopping with us. You mentioned the importance of celebrity. You spotted Camilla being worn on a celebrity. We have panelists from America, Paris and the UK and each market I find has different things that drive the consumer spend. So in Australia we don't really have celebrities unless you count home and away and um, neighbours. So I find from my conversations with retailers and brands what's driving consumers into stores is our really healthy fashion blogger content. You know even ASOS for instance collaborate with a lot of Australian bloggers to drive Australian sales. So in terms of America, from what I hear from designers, celebrity endorsements are really important. What about for Paris and for the UK? What do you find drives consumer purchasing habits? Matches fashion aren't too worried about celebrity endorsement. I'm, and me personally, I'm not too bothered about celebrity endorsement either. It can help. But we actually work with a lot of fashion bloggers as well. And we also, um, our online editorial content drives a lot of sales. And we work with a lot of fashion influencers. And they come on our site and they talk to us about their wardrobe and about their life and um, what they would wear on a day-to-day -day basis. And we work with a lot of um, people doing that. And I actually find that that's pretty successful. And actually collaborating with designers. Instagram's really interesting as well. So celebrities for me and for our business is less important. I would say online editorial content is becoming more important. I would, oops, sorry, I would agree with that as well. It's not necessarily a celebrity uh, following that really drives it, but to Catherine's point about kind of the, the fantasy and the lifestyle of it and the editorial content, how is it styled, how is it worn, how is it used in everyday life. And I think that celebrities often, or at the beginning, were our view into that. So how was it worn? And now that we you know, have some really powerful fashion bloggers, um, we have alternative ways of seeing those things other than just on celebrities. I think we, we, we've also been doing how to, um, how to style with as well and working with uh, Leandra from Man Repeller and I think Margaret Sang as well and um, they then go through our edit of brands and um, items and put together their own outfits and then they shoot them and then we have them up so, and that I have loved that because I'm like oh I love that t-shirt never thought of wearing it like that and it's their personal take on our edit and that's been really successful so I do think those these fashion influencers not just so much bloggers but just fashion influencers stylists and you know, they're really important to how we want to then buy clothes. And when and did that content strategy come into play? Like, when did you start? Because if you go on the, um, Matches, I won't mention the competitor, ASOS. Matches Fashion. Matches Fashion, <laughs> and not Netta Porter. Um, and ASOS and all of those sites, they have 
such rich content that is sometimes even yeah. better than online editorials that are standalone publications. Mm. When did that content strategy come into play? When we got investment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a few years ago we got investment and we got um, together a great online editorial team. It's a big team and they're really talented. There's lots of talent in there from British Vogue, American Vogue, um, that, that um, all kinds of newspapers around the world. Um, I think there is even some Australians and actually, that in the future, I feel that that's going to become more and more and more important. Um, and the consumer and the fashion platforms, that's going to get more and more key to, to what we're doing. So how many um, people in the editorial team? More Do than there is in buying. Really? <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's quite a lot in there. And we work with a lot of freelancers as well um, as, uh, for the shoots and the styling. And I, I'd like to ramp that up more and more and more. And I know that I think it would be great if you every week you went on and you had a you know a really high caliber shoot going. I think that'd be great. And uh, yeah, I think it's going to get more and more important. As a stylist, Catherine, do you find work growing in that area, in working for other businesses rather than just magazines? Just print. Um, yes, <laughs> <laughs> but right now at the same time with. Uh, with a lot of online platforms happening and being created constantly. Uh, and I think there will be a fast forward to all of this very soon on another level. Uh, you know, I, I remember when I first started styling and that wasn't necessarily what I specifically wanted to do. I was working more in houses and styling just happened. And it was wonderful when we were playing, when I was playing, and um, creating what we wanted to create, where image was concerned, and stylistically, of course, uh, but it was more about creating the image and the fantasy also. Uh, at one point, there was that tipping point of uh, uh, ad advertising lists that were just endless, and it, it just became as killed though, it, didn't it? Well, it just, it was definitely the beginning of the end where it was like we were just working also for the advertisers. And, uh, I mean, Is this when you were working in magazines? That happened, I mean, the 90s are back. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the 90s were great where music and fashion was concerned. And I think without being nostalgic, uh, and I don't want to at all, it was, for me, the last hurrah of fashion before the monopoly and uh, corporate cannibalism <laughs> began to suffocate a lot of the creativity. And I feel that there is becoming a backlash, but also to embrace the speed uh, at which it is at the speed of light, where everything uh, is advanced advancing but on a technological level and I think how Gucci for example has become um, a force of nature right now and extremely popular and there is that nostal nostalgia, nostalgia uh, and romance and uh, I think the more, the more sterile perhaps we become with a lot of everything that is going on in the parallel worlds that we live in uh, the craftsmanship, uh, and um, it's it's not it's not a dirty word. I think uh, you know recycling ideas, of course, but also uh, the future is. And the Copenhagen summit just came to pass just now uh, with uh, how we can uh, what's the word the, with the re uh, no the recycling and because the. Sustainable. sustainable. Thank yeah. you. Sustainable fashion, which is ultra, ultra, ultra important. But I think uh, it doesn't need to be something that is ultra, well, too organic. And you know, we can still have an aerodynamicism with everything that's happened. I know I'm rambling. I do that. <laughs> but uh, we we'll but get back to sustainability in a moment because I do think that that is an mm. important point. But it must be the future. Mm. That's we'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> But Aisha, just quickly, also around the content strategy, do you guys partner with bloggers or how, do you guys create content around Bergdorf Goodman or is the brand so strong and so iconic that it stands on its own? Well, we do have our own in-house um, 
person <laughs> yeah. um, who is fantastic. And I do think that you know one of our biggest challenges in being so old is how do we maintain our identity as a historical brand, but continue to move forward and, and really stay competitive um, with those. And so we kind of do a combination of both. We do in-house, we work with bloggers, we want to collaborate with designers. Um, we do as much of that as we can in order to really you know, stay competitive and, and stay you know, with the current trend. Mm -hmm. And what is the most successful campaigns that each of you have worked on in your respective fields? or the most successful label that you've brought into the business? It doesn't have to be an Australian label. It can be a label that you took a hunch on and saw it take flight. And why do you think it was so successful? OK, because I got to call about this, Fat Ron. Mm -hmm. um, I picked up a few seasons ago. Um, I remember going into their showroom and meeting the boys and the collective. And I was blown away. I was like, wow, this is fabulous. But I just need to go away and think about it because it's really quite strong, which I love. <laughs> and expensive? No? Yeah. No, it's not, not, not too, too bad. bad. <laughs> Compared to some things. Yeah. So um, we kept in touch and I went in the following season and I was, we were ready and we picked it up. And it was quite quiet for a little while. And I, the jeans that everybody's desperately after sat, sat on nine for a little while. And, gorgeous trench coats and then something just clicked and it all just started getting a bit of a cult following and moving um, and that has been a phenomenal success really really big success and when they when we got the call that they were going to get Balenciaga that for me I felt so happy for them I'm still getting emotional about it um, because they're from you know they're they're proper designers, they're, they're, they've pulled themselves up, they come from Georgia, they don't have any kind of special privileges, they've worked really, really hard, both of them in the retail industry and design industry, and for them to get the Balenciaga gig was just like, it was so punk, it was just yeah. brilliant, I loved it, you know, and it, it was, and I think that the success of them just shows you, you can be a great designer, just, you know, it's just, it's about that. And um, I'm really, really happy about that brand. That's yeah. been really good success because we work extremely closely with them. I get lots of special things. Aww, <laughs> Not for me, but for our, for our oh. business. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll give me a lot of uh, runway exclusives <laughs> and, and oh, wow, special so stock just specifically for yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the holy grail, of course. You want people to come to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, can't they do elsewhere. things like that for other people as well, but that's also something about the future that I think that they're, they're off, you know, they were quite instrumental in changing the, the calendar as well of how we're going to be watching runway shows. They've been very instrumental with Anna Wintour in doing that. And they do work with me on some runway exclusives, but they do do that with other um, retailers that they're working with as well. Um, it's not just me. But it's quite interesting because I think that's quite an interesting way. You know, when you see so much on the catwalk, you imagine if you can only get that from that retailer mm -hmm. and that from that yeah, person. Yeah, yeah. Or it makes that advertising. It's, it's just more intimate. And I think we'd lost some intimacy. Yeah. And we'd lost, you know, uh, things need to feel really personal yeah. um, and creative and, you need, and passionate. And nobody just wants to be churned out unsustainable fast fashion. Exactly. Even though fashion and the way we're shopping is becoming fast, um, we hold a lot of integrity with the designers that we work with um, and making sure that, you know, if we work with the designer and their aesthetic is that and then everybody else does it, we won't touch it from yeah. all those other people. We remain true. I mean, there's some designers that I know you're really good friends with that we've worked with for many years um, and their aesthetic <coughs> is, and, you know, and it's a good relationship. Mm -hmm. And um, to have I want that to translate to the customer. I want them to feel like they're coming to us and they're getting good, good product that comes from a good relationship and a good viewpoint. What do you think that surge came from when that stock stayed quiet for a little while? I don't know. Maybe it was a celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was the opposite, actually. But it was anti-fashion, wasn't it? it? Completely yeah. anti-fashion. But it was also um, we we have been going through a period where a lot of casualties in fashion have come to pass and um, it started not that long ago but there is still that whirlwind of uh, musical chairs which is mm -hmm. again still quite constant and I think they were the obvious um, response to all of that as well and in a way I believe that uh, how when Eddie became uh, the art director at Yves Saint Laurent 
um, and he did turn the visage around, mm. which was very, very intelligent. And of course, there was so much backlash or uh, revolt against what he was pushing because what he was really creating, in a way, were staple pieces, mm. hence vêtements, which means clothing. And clothes, and I think, and I'm not saying that vêtements would never have been born without Eddie Sleeman, but it was just, I think, it's a it's natural... Mm. passage to, to where we are now. And again, for me, uh, having moved to Paris in the 90s, I feel that Vetmont has, well, I mean, they are also children of the 90s of that period where uh, they... Children of the night. And the night as well, <laughs> darling, of the marathon um, with Margiela and it, that deconstruction, but yet uh, an anti-glamour, but yet it's ultra, ultra chic at the same time. The craftsmanship, yeah. although it's, it looks like a t-shirt, perhaps that's why it's 2,000 million euros or whatever. <laughs> yeah. no, they, they once laid out a dress for me on, on the table. It's also taking the piss a lot, though. But do you think which is, he laid a dress which, out once for me, Denver, on the table, and he showed me that there was one hole that had been cut there for the head for the dress, and that everything else was just one piece of fabric. So it wasn't, when you put it's it very on, V&A. it looks very complicated, but there's a lot of thought that that is one person that knows how to cut wait, the wait, wait, wait. And it's I think strange. that was, um, that's what made me believe in the collection because there's a lot more to it than the knowledge is there. Yeah, yeah. And Aisha, have you had one of those aha moments with the brand? Um, I think we have, we, I think, have quite a few successes at Bergdorf Goodman as a whole, um, you know, specifically. And what I think is the most exciting about being at Bergdorf Goodman is that people often look to us for what is the next greatest thing, which can be good or bad because there's a lot of pressure in that. Um, the fifth floor has been turned so quickly, it's contemporary, and self portrait has been gangbusters instantly and immediately. It came in and it's gone out. Um, Sorry, just a sec. I think we have a mic issue a with Aisha. Something yeah. Exploded. Something exploded. <laughs> <laughs> the American pop. Oh. Oh, hello. I'm no, you're okay. So, Aisha. Oh, Catherine, are you off? Yeah. So we might just. It's the anti-fashion, anti lapel pro old school mic. Um, so, Aisha, sorry. Can you? Um, you were talking about. Uh, Fifth label? No. Fifth floor Fifth is floor. our contemporary floor. Um, okay. And like self portrait was. I think I'm you're on, right. I'm yeah. Okay. Am I? Um, self portrait, I mean, we haven't been able to kind of keep that stock. Um, we haven't been able to keep it. And I think that, you know, we have, we have a customer that is very sophisticated and it, it's got this lady but edgy feel. And I think she was just kind of looking for, you know, what, what the next thing was, and we kind of inundated her with that and gave her, um, you know, a new resource to look to, and it has been very successful. And with what we're seeing around the world, which was mentioned a bit earlier, with the see now, buy now culture, you know, challenging traditional buying cycles, how do you manage those expectations within your own businesses? I think that the exclusive collaborations, we're certainly seeing that in Australia, even with. Um, Parlor X, which is one of the most iconic multi-brand boutiques in the country, does a lot of one-off collaborations with Australian designers. Where, how do you manage that? The collaborations that we... Hello. The collaborations, when we started them, were quite strategic um, to deliver at certain times of the year where deliveries were low. Um, because I've worked in many different areas of the industry I knew how that production cycle works so there's certain times the factories get quiet and this way the designer gets a bit more money they get to produce a bit more things and then we get a delivery outside of the normal windows when the customer's getting a bit fed up because there's nothing new coming in so they were born out of that kind of buy now where now but we didn't call it that we just called it I don't know what we called it but that's how how it was born we, I think we have consciously, for a few years, bought quite trans-seasonally. Mm. So we don't, um, we think about um, the global weather um, and that 
there's it's going to be hot somewhere and it's and it's also going to be cold somewhere so we're constantly working with knitwear and i'm constantly working it doesn't coats i can have some shearlings deliver in january which may seem a little bit odd because there's all summer collections coming in but it will be cold somewhere and so um to get out of that mindset of well it's winter i need to buy coats well no it's going to deliver in july it, 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 you just got to the, it took longer for the designers to respond. It took them a lot longer. And then finally you get, you know, you go into a showroom and there'd be a rack of clothing that women would want to wear when it gets delivered. It was like, yay, great, we're, we're getting there. Um, so I think, the, and the consumer has responded to that. I, and I think, you know, we, being in New York, I think that's kind of, we've had that specifically as it speaks to the resort collection, you know, which yeah. was in November and December. and. You know, having dealt with coats and swim, I have watched this mm. juxtaposition for years and have and waited for designers to get on board. <laughs> Someone's uh, always traveling, no? Always yeah. traveling. And so oh. my biggest coat business is in November and December, but so is the swim department. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And so, we, you know, we always make the joke that, like, is she, is she wearing a bikini under yeah, her mom's clear coat? But, I mean, but essentially Probably. she's going away. She's, <laughs> <I> she's, <laughs> she's trying to go somewhere else and how are we? And it, ultimately, I think it just becomes a customer we service. As well. issue mm -hmm. and how are we how are we going to be the resource for her to come get whatever she needs whenever whenever she needs it mm. and do you think that there's an opportunity with Australian Fashion Week realigning to the resort season for us to capture some of that upswing or is it challenging as a buyer or as a stylist to source things that are so far away and the challenges of communication and Aisha you mentioned as a, a broad lesson for all designers which I hear from every single buyer whether they're at department store online store or independent store which is deliver on time deliver on time is there an opportunity for Australian designers to really capture that resort season yeah or, yeah? yeah yeah it's perfect that they've done this scheduling and it's perfect delivery. Mm -hmm. It's the strongest delivery out of the whole year. It's the delivery that- it's the majority of the Yeah, for the whole year, it's our biggest spend. So, and it's the biggest sales. So it's really important that they've got onto this, onto if anything, this schedule. Resort, I think is the most important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And How did the in-between cool. season become so lucrative? I don't know. Because the seasons are changing. Demand. <laughs> and do you think seasons- Well, also, yeah. I mean, I can say, being in Paris these last two winters, we didn't really have a winter, but you know, global mm. change. Yes. Uh, and uh, and I mean, winter is specifically a certain moment, and so is summer, but perhaps not in Australia. Um, and people are also constantly traveling. The seasonal pieces that can translate mm. from autumn, winter, spring, summer, and maybe there is that major coat, or there is that divine bikini. Uh, but everything in between is resort and pre fall yeah. and that is why it sells so much more uh, and there are so many more uh, pieces to play with and it's absolutely it's right. ultra important. Runway is still, still important. Runway though, is the fantasy. Yeah. Well, and that's why I like that we are having this fashion week centered around resort. It, it's got a longer shelf life and I think every show we've been used to going to is about runway. It's a, it's, it can be more um, fantasy driven, but has just a shorter kind of shelf life um, in the store. And so I love that they're taking the time to really, you know, give us a full view uh, of their vision of what this particular, because I think that we don't see this anywhere else where we take the time to have a show for a resort collection. Unless when if you go to Rio for Louis for, Vuitton right. or you go to Cuba but, for but Chanel. That's or, the specific, wait, you know, wait, specific wait, wait. buyers. I don't, I don't know that there's enough coverage in that sense um, on, those, on this delivery. Our yeah. biggest season is the spring racing season. Yeah. That's where retailers tell me they generally make up a lot of their spend. A lot of Australian designers do not cater to the resort season, so they do autumn, winter, and spring, summer, but leave out resort entirely. Why is it such an important season on the international calendar? P purely what uh, Catherine said. That's why mm -hmm. it's that transseasonal time. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also a, a season that is. Uh, being desired, although when we go into fall, that is also the desired season mm. because you know you have that extreme climate, perhaps of summer, and we love to layer. I think in autumn, fall, 
and play. And spring has that same uh, aspect where we can wear a trench or a coat with multi different situations. Mm -hmm. You were talking a bit about sustainability and ethics and all of that coming to the forefront. At the end of the day, a lot of the brands that we all work with or that we report on are driven by commercial incentives, whether it's because they're under investment, under private investors or shareholders. I guess this is a question for you, Catherine. How do you see the fashion world balancing commercial imperatives with this growing movement around sustainability and ethical supply? Because um, you're obviously very creative and a corporate business would bring you in to infuse their brand with integrity and the unique vision that you have. But they are so, there's that conflict there is between a, the it's two. It's a fine line. Mm. Uh, but again, I think um, we are as um, a mass, well mass, uh, moving or trying to move into that direction. I know, uh, and they have had some uh, backlash where H&M is creating a sustainability uh, recycling, but I think that is also um, driven purely by um, uh, consumer mm -hmm. disposability yeah. and buy more and recycle more, but buy more, you know. Um, it's, it's a topic that is uh, ultra sensitive because, you know, there, there is a fine line, but I think um, we are all responsible, even as consumers. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> There's a lot of big brands that, uh, like Stella McCartney has always been very, she really pioneered the way. I think people forget, you know, she, she had really long time ago mm. pioneered all that sustainability. And we're um, very conscious at the moment as a business to be thinking more, we're trying to go paperless, which is driving me insane. <laughs> and um, we're trying to work with, whenever, there's a few brands recently that I've started to work with and they'll tell me a story about how they found a factory that was developing this cotton in India or somewhere like that, I think it was. I think it was India. And they were about to be closed because nobody was using this cotton anymore. So she single-handedly, through her brand, kept this 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 uh, factory alive, the artisans alive, the people that are making this fabric alive, which is a sustainable mm. cotton. And that those kind of stories we will then tell through our online um, editorial content because to be conscious of what we're doing is really important. I don't really like this kind of throwaway fashion and um, where people aren't being very thoughtful about sustainability and some of the is it I think it's the curving group are um, you know they're really big on the sustainability and all the companies all the brands that work for them have to be so it's becoming more and more and it's really good it's great yeah that we're thinking like that and footprint and well, I think sometimes you just have to trust that the consumer is going to get behind yeah. the sustainability of it as well I think you know to your point it is hard sometimes when you have to answer to a board or you know, have some sort of financial um, repercussions, but I think the consumer responds with that when there is a story. You know, and I think I think about Tom's and how successful that business was when it was introduced. Because for every pair of shoes you bought, you know, and I, I think the consumer will absolutely get behind it if it's something that they believe in as well. And in terms of saleability, what imperatives are you guys driven by as buyers? Are you looking for something that is commercial or creative? And how long do you bet on a designer before you have to let them go from the portfolio? Commercially and creative, you need both. Okay. Absolutely, there's no point having one without the other. Um, if a brand has both, then it's great. You're on to a winner. <laughs> yeah. And it's really, really good, but it's a, it's, a, it's a balancing act, and that's a job as a buying team to make sure that the edit has a lot of commerciality for, but also supporting a lot of creativity. And we have been known to work with designers for quite a few seasons, um, and with very late deliveries, uh, but we will continue to support because we're backing you and we're believing in you and it's about partnership and we'll give you that global uh, platform because we believe in your creativity and we believe it will it will work. I think it's it's not all companies work like that. I'm very lucky that I do work for a company like that. 
and I couldn't otherwise. Mm. Creativity to me is extremely important. It's the only way that we're going to get new designs mm. and, and newness on the market. Um, and sometimes those designers need some support. It's not all a. Uh, it's not. I don't like. It can't this. be suffocation. Yeah, yeah and it can just, be. I don't want to be one of those. Where, where, yeah. I don't want to be one it of those. It kills the shit. It can always just be about the bottom line. I mean, yeah, you know, we. Sometimes I have to sit in those meetings. I don't care about the bottom line. <laughs> this person is going to be successful. They will, and it's and it works. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. But it's about people having that trust and faith in you, and about having a different point of view as a retailer as well. Otherwise, we're all just the same retailers, aren't we? So, Aisha, have you ever had to fight for a label? Uh, all the time. Oh. <laughs> I think it's an interesting dynamic. You know, we as a buying team, and then we also have a planning team who financially plans mm. the business. And, and what I try to do as a buyer is include them in the market appointment or share with them the runway show so that when I'm having the conversation, I need more money. Yeah. <laughs> I have to overspend. Um, that they feel as emotional to the product as I do, and then it's not so much of a yeah, fight. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, and I think that is where we find the, the synergy. And then we work together, and we find a way to make it work. And do I buy less? You know, um, it is it is a bit of a balance. And and you got to do it all in about an hour. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, normally. How often do you meet with the planners? Um, well, every every um, they're like two doors down. <laughs> okay, yeah. are together all the time. We talk to each other quite frequently, and I think. That is the success of that. I know that some other retailers have very siloed um, yeah, structures, and so it's kind of like they set a budget and you just have to work within it. And I think that's what makes us successful, is that we have the ability to work together. Mm -hmm. mm. And Catherine, you have your own line, um, or had your own line. I have these glasses online. Amazing. <laughs> Are they your, your own that's, brand? That's from my collection. Amazing. And you can I buy them on friendof.com. <laughs> and actually, sustainability, uh, when I created the collection with friends, and hence the friend of, uh, I worked with a, an association in Holland uh, called Orange Babies. And uh, that was in, I think, early 2000. There was a fabulous show, and it was a charity dinner. And um, I think uh, that giving back aspect is, has become also a big trend. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of fake philanthropy out there, I'm sure. But, and that's why I prefer to, 10% uh, goes to the Orange Babies Foundation, which helps uh, women and with their <laughs> newborns or children that have um, uh, contracted AIDS. Uh, it just, that organization touched me, and there are others for the environment, Environment, I'm sure. Um, do you sell only directly via the website, or do you no, have other stuff? Uh, also Colette in Paris, and uh, Dover Street Market in London and New York, and Tokyo, and maybe Matches. And, and uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> So glad I'm sitting in the middle. Um, but also in 2012, I created a pajama collection uh, with uh, uh, another friend, friend feeling, a laboratorial situation, uh, and um, and with Gripois with the fantasy jewelry, costume jewelry, not fantasy jewelry. And having been on the other end of that cycle, so as a designer dealing with a buyer. What do you find are the most challenging aspects other than delivering on time, which seems to be a theme? Uh, and why do designers deliver late? I never understand that. Production. I think I'm so the production is the, the factory. Production. It's not the designer, okay. really. It's the production. But then just brief the factory. Details. No, but a lot, of they lie. The, a lot of the times they lie. the production says yes, 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 yes. You and it's sit there, usually don't you? no. <laughs> and the small designers get pushed to the end of the production run. So the, but the bigger designers are the ones that are spending more money at the front of the run. Oui, voilà. And also. the smaller ones are at the end. So the smaller designers, when you pick them up and back them, they are going to have a later delivery. You're it's so just no, sympathetic. Oh, I, I would be I've, like, you're out. I've sat in those factories and I've sat on top of them. And unless you're sat there next to the man sewing it, they're not going to sew it. You walk out the door and they're on doing somebody else's sewing. Yeah. 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 I mean, but sometimes at the end of the day, it's really just a communication issue. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be late. <laughs> Tell me quick, sooner yeah, rather than yeah, later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. It's, 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 it's kind communication. Of to, wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, fought yeah, for yeah, the yeah. receipts. I fought for you, yeah. you know. Yeah, um, I am sympathetic, but I'm also, yeah, it is about having communication because 
we need to know. Mm. Um, we need to plan and be able to kind of cover what losses <coughs> for that as well. You know, it is difficult. And then you have Azadina Leia. Oh, I love him because he just delivers Wait, me whenever. Wait, whenever. Whenever. Well, that's, well, that's, that's, that's sort of does you, everything. The ultimate also, luxury time. And uh, when it's ready, it's ready, no? Yeah. When he wants to show, he shows. He shows. Yeah. But I love going in. Shanda, it, I love. It's, it's, I, it's, it's very, very punk, punk as well. <laughs> yeah. You just go in, they do what they want, when they right. want to do it. And I sometimes think that's, that's the, the most exciting thing. Just yeah. do beat to your own drum. Wait, wait, wait. Exactly. Worry about it does else. work. Yeah. Also. And for any designers in the audience, why is delivering to you so important on time? What happens if we deliver late? You I miss the boat. You. Why? <laughs> you miss the boat. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's all markdowns, different. isn't it? Yeah. Because oh, the lady you deliver it, it, it shortens your, it shortens it's your it's selling different. window for sure. And I also think, you know, our consumers are very savvy. They know when new merchandise mm -hmm. is hitting the floor. And if your stuff isn't there, right when they're there hitting yeah, the floor yeah, looking yeah. for new stuff, you're kind of missing, missing the that first window of like when yeah. they're super excited about fashion and how do we get the consumer back in once you finally get it's it. It's true, here, so. yeah. Yeah. And Catherine? Mm -hmm. With dealing with buyers, what do you? What advice nice. would you have for designers? Um, how do you pitch yourself? How do you? How do you approach them? How do you capture their attention? I mean, well, like that. But other sincerity. <laughs> no. I think definitely um, to to well to know what you want to do and what you're doing. And um, I think once you believe and you want to create something specific it does become contagious. Mm -hmm. uh, I know, but that's also me, I design things or work on projects where I would want to have for myself and I think that isn't necessarily an ego, selfish, vain uh, mindset, but I believe that if I want this, I'm sure someone else out there also wants mm -hmm. this. And usually it is true. I think Elsa Scaparelli said that mm -hmm. a long time ago. <laughs> but do you sell it yourself or do you go via an agent? Uh, it depends you both. To sell it, yourself. it depends both yeah. and it works better when I'm involved, yeah. of course. But I also love to meet buyers or uh, whoever I'm being and it, it does become a love affair as well. And, and the, uh, the, you know, like a family yeah, yeah. story where... We're buying into yeah, you. Yeah, buy into it, story. It's not sterile, which is divine because, you know, I think uh, there will be more apps and there will be more buy now, see now, buy now. Uh, but the, the foundation is definitely human. And Natalie, you had your own label at one stage as well. So you have sat on both sides of the fence. Oh, was it not a very good one? No, of course it was. Okay. <laughs> I just don't talk about it very much because then people want to know what it is. Yeah, what, what it is was. it? What was it called? I've got so many past lives. Oh I reinvent God, myself all the time. Aisha's been um. a pilot. I think that <laughs> takes the cake. Like she can actually fly a plane. I love. <laughs> and financially. <laughs> for a spin. Because you need to fly a plane in New York. Plenty of helicopter oh, yeah. still. <laughs> Tons of airspace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think having my own brand taught me um, I had to sell it, I had to design it, get somebody to make it, I had to find a factory to produce it, I had to then sell it, press it, deliver it, put it in boxes, deliver it. I did everything from A to Z, so I, I learned a lot. <coughs> yes, yeah, yeah, from fabrics to... what What's interesting when I look back at it, and I do have to get out my kind of portfolio and friends want to see it sometimes, um, the aesthetic there is very true to the aesthetic that I like today. Um, lots of shirting men's cottons and ginghams and stripes and blue and white and ribbons and pom-poms and I haven't actually changed <laughs> that much. It's quite interesting. Lots of vintage touches. I think at the time um, I did manage to get some really nice press and good stockists. Um, I stopped because the designing and the creative part of it became such a small window because everything else took up all the time and I was like hang on I did this because I wanted to be creative and actually I'm having to spend more time selling it sitting in the factory uh, which was in Istanbul oh, oh god wow. that, yeah yeah that was, that was a time wow. <laughs> and on my own so um, I decided to, that's why I decided to stop it actually um, there was a point of where we can get investment and bring in lots of people and I wasn't sure that I was ready for that. I'm not a trained designer. Mm -hmm. I did start off as a buyer, as a young girl, 
for um, Joseph. Um, she worked at Joseph. Oh, did you? Yeah. Everybody works at Joseph. It was <laughs> amazing. Oh, really, really. And um, he sent me off to um, the Alexander McQueen shows in London, and I persuaded him to pick it up, promised him it would be a big brand. I persuaded him for Eddie Slim and Saint Laurent. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh. He, it, it, it was great. And so I, want, I just thought I'd get back into it that way, and hopefully I could be... Buy, buying is quite a creative... Um, it's more creative than people think. Yeah. Um, you get to see all the wonderful product, you can work with the designers, um, and uh, it's not just analytical, so it is pretty creative. Um, but I think there's a merchant in me as well, because when I used to sell my collection, I just enjoyed the buying and selling, and I still enjoy the buying and selling exactly. aspect of it, yeah. Leave the creating up to the, 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 creatives. the, the creatives, yeah. I just like to buy and but sell. But it, it is all creative. The, it is. The buying and selling. Yeah. Um, you have to have that fire, no? That instinctive. Yeah, yeah. And that goes with creativity. Where, um, you know, of course, trends can be translated through the editors after mm. shows, and all the shows at the end of the season are broken down, and buyers will be, um, you know, editing the shows as well. What was the most uh, trending mm. and trend, whatever going on through that season and that is also uh, something that mm. needs to have a creative sensibility otherwise yeah I hear that a lot from Australian designers a lot of them don't have the head office count that most people would think they have they don't have hundreds of people no. working there if anything they were like you in those days and doing production PR yeah. marketing selling yeah. Catherine for someone as super hyper creative as you how do you manage the creative aspects which you manifest with actually producing your accessories or producing your eyewear or well with where the accessories um, the jewelry collection was is concerned uh, that was a collaboration with Gripois <laughs> and they were dealing with the production more than I was I was more the visage and the creative which I really Perfect. enjoyed that too and I think um, I think the collaborational aspect is also something that is growing more and more. Um, but of course, when I do with the eyewear, uh, it's, a, it's a constant juggling act. Um, and again, you want to do this because you love, there is the passion. Um, it's not easy. You, you have to really want this uh, more than anything. Um, and you have to maybe go to the factory a lot to <laughs> get to push things along. <laughs> Wait. And Aisha, if you see something truly creative and you bring on board an emerging or a new label, do you in some ways, like Natalie, take on a mentoring role where you Absolutely. support the designer? And if you do, what kind of advice do you give them from a practical sense? It's funny, it doesn't necessarily have to be an emerging designer either. I think I spend quite a significant amount of time, you know, pre-market thinking about even my biggest businesses and what is it that I need from them. And, you know, I kind of create a deck, you know, how can we work together to really make this, um, you know, something that is going to be great for Burke Drift Goodwin specifically. Um, and when somebody is particularly when they're kind of like a one-man show, you know, we do take the time to, to handhold a little bit and walk them through. And, and much like the designer and packing it themselves, I'm on the phone with them, talking them through the shipping guidelines just to make sure they don't get charged back erroneously and because I know that there is it's this kind of big scary world as a, as a big um, store um, and it, because we want them to be successful. I made the investment the same way that they're making the investment and so you know we try to do our best to make sure that we're and how do we get them exposed um, whether it's through advertising or social media and again and emphasizing the shipping on time and things like that. I think you know sometimes creative people don't always have that in the forefront of their mind, and I have to, you know, remind them. And so I, you know, and that's one of the things I'm happy to do it because it's we're kind of birthing something together, um, and I think it's more successful when all parties involved feel like they have a, a piece of that. Do you guys send your brand sales reports, and are they interested in every learning week. how they're tracking every week? Every week. They should be. They should be. Yeah. Are they? Yeah. yeah. Yes. 
There's a few I know that don't. Yeah. And I'm like, why am I saying this? <laughs> <laughs> There's a few I know that don't. I'm like, how do you mean you haven't looked at what you've been selling for three years and or more? And Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Some of it, and it's quite scary. But um, creatively, I think it's just not in their some of their DNA, DNA and they just create and. Um, sometimes if you look too closely at the sales as a designer, as a creative, then you could have a tendency to go, well, that shape worked really well, I'll repeat that shape. Mm. And that price point worked really well, so I'll repeat that. And as much as you need an element of that, it shouldn't drive the whole creative mm. process. Mm. So looking at your sales is quite good, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't influence too much because... You know, one season it could all be about an ankle boot, and the next season it's about thigh high boot. But if you're just gonna look at the ankle boot again, you just need to let the creative juices go, and then the instinct. Yeah. And also, think you have to keep in mind the market. I, we had a we had a tough fall. Fall for retail was not as strong as it has been in the past. And for anybody that's looking at the selling on a weekly basis, that was a hard mm. season to really be looking at the selling. Um, but we needed people to keep their eye on the prize and go right back to it and come back to us with the resort and spring and new fall collections that were strong and compelling that we could continue to, to buy into. Autumn has been a tough sell for Australian retailers as well because if you step outside, you don't really need a coat, you don't need any knitwear. And so there was a recent report saying it's a countdown to which retailer goes into markdown mode first mm. on autumn stock that has been sitting there and not moving because the weather is like, it's spring outside. We just so had the same problem in New York. Yeah, oh, it was a hot, hot fall for you guys as well. It was a not as cold. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I wouldn't describe it as, as warm. Out there. It was definitely not Cold. And you know, given you know, for us where we're located, there's a couple, you know, of us in within a certain radius, and it is always about who's going to take the mark down first, and then it's sort of uh, this kind of scramble. So, and how do you make those decisions? Because if you discount too early, if you discount too late, what what is the thinking process there, Natalie? Um, <laughs> we, I can see you. Highly. Yeah, because we don't, we didn't have a tough time. Okay. And I know when I got to New York and I heard a lot of the retailers, they did, we didn't have a tough time. We're thinking globally and we're shipping globally and that seems to be playing to our strengths. Um, and when it comes to markdown, we like to drive a full price, full margin business. And I, I can't bear markdown. I yeah. can't bear it. I don't, I don't, I don't, when everybody's worked so hard to create this beautiful product, especially runway product, mm. uh, there's nothing more heartbreaking than seeing that incredible frock that's taken somebody hours to embroider, just to have a, like, a red pen on it. I just, it just shouldn't be. So we're not, we're not very big on markdown, mm -hmm. and I'm hoping that things will change a little bit on that. And we are, bit, as a country, bit, yeah, we're, we're cracked and up it gets, on this It's sort of like throwaway <laughs> fashion again, isn't it? You know, if something's beautiful, it's always beautiful, and... I think that, you know, as a retailer, there needs to be an element of, of, marking, of marking down at some point. But I think at the moment it's too aggressive and it's too early, especially well, in the I, States. I find that we have that challenge because we do as well try to really maximise our regular price selling. And there is nothing I hate more than marking season. It just it looks terrible. It's not, as, it's not the way we envision it. Um, and some designers really don't like to see their beautiful one-way pieces no. marked down no, either. You know, it's 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 not where we want to be. So whether you know the, the designers need to be more discerning with who they're selling to and selling less of those special Perhaps pieces, producing or, less mm, specific quantities, yeah, mm -hmm. making things more limited. You know, there's lots of ways around it. Mm. And the final question I have before I throw out to the audience for any questions you might have is what do you see are the opportunities for Australian designers in the future moving forward? And how can they maximise on them? Um, there are one. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I didn't think I can. Wait, let me think. Um, I mean, I think we kind of touched on it, and I, it's just about having a point of view. We're going to find and source and get behind brands that have a point of view that um, 
kind of stick with that and, and provide something different mm. in the marketplace. Um, and I, I think that's something that can be said for not just Australian designers, certainly mm. because we're here mm -hmm. um, and we now, and Australia now currently has this, has this global attention for sure. But you know, we, we are always just trying to, my favorite part of the job is curating the space, curating the floor, curating the assortment. Um, and so if there's something to be seen and to be touched and felt and, and a fantasy to be created, we want to get behind it. And sometimes I'll see brands um, that are not right for Maps Fashion, but I believe that the brand is a good brand and has a good commercial place on the market, but just not for our vision and for what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that brand, uh, designers and brands know that. Just because we haven't partnered with you doesn't mean that you're, not, you know, that you're no good. It just means that you're not right for us at that particular moment mm. that our vision is to do something else and your vision is going over there and your you know your your <laughs> retailers are over there it's not our, not us and it's quite hard to get that point across but mm. it's almost like as i don't know like you know when you're uh, a singer or an art or a different type of artist that to just keep plugging away at it because your moment will come mm -hmm. it's you know it doesn't doesn't just happen overnight and Catherine and yeah Absolutely. Catherine, an Australian in Paris? Um, this is the first official resort. Uh, mm. I think that's an extremely intelligent move in itself. Uh, but also I believe that the Australian designers um, should consider not necessarily resort as bathing suits and, you yes. know, but also incorporate a larger scale of mm -hmm. a full collection. Uh, which I haven't necessarily seen everywhere mm -hmm. uh, at the shows, and I think this is the moment to really um, dive into that full body collection mm. sea and uh, and catch this wave because uh, the world is getting smaller and everything is moving faster. And again, having an individuality, uh, a, a voice. Uh, that does not resonate elsewhere. Uh, an individual individuality mm -hmm. is very important. But this is extremely exciting. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here, darling. I would be in <laughs> can right now. <laughs> All right. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes. Hi. Um, I have a question for Catherine. Mm? It's when, uh, absolutely. When everyone wants to attract attention, mm. you would attract an audience for that? Well, I think um, that's a very interesting question. But at the same time as uh, what we're living, or what the masses are living, with that instant and I self moment, I think uh, how designers, who I believe should also shake things up and move things forward, um, Margiela was like a laboratorial uh, collective, as mm. what Vetmore is. And but also, uh, when he was really, when nobody knew who he was, I remember everybody was desperate to know who but he voila, was. And so it just had the opposite effect anyway. And he I got more attention because we're, nobody knew who he was. Yeah. And it, it wasn't really about the design. And of course now, mm -hmm. perhaps after the Raf and Albert Elba's exit stage left mm -hmm. moment happened, uh, and of course, perhaps with the celebrities, we are becoming more introverted to really create uh, a direction and, and a product or, you know, a creativity, a creativeness to what fashion I feel should be globally. Um, it's definitely cyclical, and we're back to the 90s, but I think in a good way, and whenever we do, and we've never left the 80s, and we'll never leave the 70s or the 60s, and the 90s was the 60s, but, you know, and that's... <laughs> I know, it's true. That's how, and, you know, every generation will become nostalgic mm -hmm. with, a, you know, a story that they did not experience, mm -hmm. and then it will be translated again, and... Uh, it's also relevant and irrelevant to what is happening with technology. So it all, I think I answered your question. 
<laughs> All right, one, we have time for one more question. One more. I'm going to start picking on someone. Oh, here we go. Mario Testino. Um, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Zimmerman. I think it was, you know. Yeah. For me, it was. Um, and actually, it was about five years ago, and I came and I went to their show, and I wasn't very familiar with the brand. We then bought it, and it delivered in winter, summer stock. I was like, oh no. And it flew out, and that was the first real sign of, hang on a minute. You know, with trans-seasonal product is really important, and this brand is great. <laughs> um, so for me, it was it was as simple as that. Looking globally for new talent and brands, um, and also wanting to understand the global market and how I'm fascinated by every country I go to. I'm really looking at uh, the women and what they're wearing and where they're eating, and how their lifestyles are. Do they get in lots of cabs? Do they have to walk everywhere? And then. You know, you can then tell what shoes everybody's got to wear. And like in Hong Kong, everything's up, so they all wear flats. And then when they get somewhere, they put the heels on. Here, everyone's in cars. LA, they all in cars, but wear flip flops. I'm more fascinated by that. And uh, and then when I'm looking at collections, thinking mm, that country will really like that, and that country will really like this aesthetic. And um, so for me, coming to Australia those years ago, it was getting to understand the consumer. And then I was lucky enough to. There were some great brands here that I was unaware of, so it was. I've always now got a keen eye over here to see what's going on. Mm. Fantastic. And um, just before we thank our speakers for their time this afternoon, you're more than welcome to come to the Mercedes Benz Star Lounge for networking drinks. If you just advise security that you came to our forum, they will let you in. But in the meantime, and if they don't, just come and find me. In the meantime, please join me in thanking our fantastic panel for sharing their insights this afternoon. Ha, ha, ha.